Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part one of the section of the book titled Polar Decomposition and Singular Value Decomposition. In this video, we will focus on the polar decomposition. Let's quickly review the notation we need for this section. F denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. Also, V denotes a finite dimensional inner product space over our field F. It will be useful to review some material about positive operators from the previous section of the book. Recall that a positive operator is defined to be an operator that is self adjoint and with the property that T of V inner product V is a non negative number for every vector V. Recall also that an operator R is called a square root of an operator T if R squared is equal to T. Then in the last section, we had this characterization of positive operators, which gives several alternative ways to think about positive operators. The theorem says that if T is an operator on V, then the following are equivalent. Property A is that T is positive. Property B is that T is self-adjoint and all eigenvalues of T are non-negative. Property C is that T has a positive square root. Property D is that T has a self-adjoint square root. And property E is that there exists an operator R on V such that T is equal to R star R. Recall also that we previously stated the following result. Every positive operator on V has a unique positive square root. This leads to the obvious notation. If T is a positive operator, then we use the usual square root notation to denote the positive square root of T. To motivate the polar decomposition for operators, let's look at the polar decomposition on the set of complex numbers. If we have complex number Z, we can write z in the form shown here. z is equal to r times the cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta, where r is the absolute value of z and theta is some angle. Multiplication of complex numbers is commutative. So let's reverse the order of these two factors. And instead of writing r, let's write absolute value of z. And instead of writing cosine theta plus i sine theta, Let's write z divided by the absolute value of z, which of course that first factor needs to be to make the equation true. Now recall that the complex conjugate of z times z is equal to the absolute value of z squared. Thus the absolute value of z is the square root of the complex conjugate of z times z. So we get the last equation shown here, where we also recorded that the absolute value of that first factor, z divided by the absolute value of z, is 1. This may seem a strange way to write the polar decomposition on c, but this is the way that gives the best analogy with operator theory. In previous videos, I have mentioned a few times the analogy between c, the complex numbers, and l of v, the operators on v. Now we're going to be a bit more specific about that analogy because it will help us a lot with the polar decomposition. In this analogy, we think of a complex number z as being analogous to an operator t on v. We think of the complex conjugate of the number z as analogous to the adjoint of t. Using those analogies, if z is a real number, that means z is equal to its complex conjugate. The analogous concept in L of v is that t is self-adjoint because self-adjointness is defined by t is equal to t star. The next two lines in each column show the analogy on the left, z being non-negative, which is also written below in parentheses. A complex number is non-negative if and only if it can be written in the form w bar times w for some complex number w. And the analogy in L of v is that t is a positive operator. It would be better to call those non-negative, but they're called positive operators. And one of the conditions that we had for being a positive operator was that t is equal to r star r 
for some operator r on v. Next, we want to think of the circle in the complex plane centered at the origin with radius 1. That circle is defined by the equation the absolute value of z is equal to 1, which we could write as z bar z is equal to 1, because z bar z is the absolute value of z squared, and the absolute value of z squared is 1 precisely when the absolute value of z is 1. That's analogous, on the right, to t being an isometry because one of the conditions we saw that was equivalent to being an isometry is that t star t is equal to i. Finally, we have the polar decomposition for a complex number z shown in red in the c column. Its analogy is shown in the L of v column. We write t is equal to s, being an isometry, that corresponds to the complex number z divided by the absolute value of z that has absolute value 1, because being an isometry corresponds to having absolute value 1. So we get t equals s, an isometry, times the square root of t star t, which corresponds perfectly to the square root of z bar z. So that statement that t is equal to s times the square root of t star t for some isometry s is precisely what is called the polar decomposition for an operator. That will be the subject of our next theorem. Here is the formal statement of the polar decomposition theorem, which we motivated in the last slide. This theorem is a big deal, so let's give it a little Beethoven music to introduce it. The polar decomposition theorem states that if t is an operator on v, then there exists an isometry s on v such that t is equal to s times the square root of t star t. Before outlining the ideas of the proof of the polar decomposition theorem, I'd like to explain why it's such a marvelous theorem. The polar decomposition theorem says that we can write an arbitrary operator t as a product of two operators, both of which we understand pretty well. For example, let's look at the second operator, the square root of t star t. That's a positive operator, hence it's self-adjoint and normal. And thus, the spectral theorem, either the real spectral theorem or the complex spectral theorem, depending upon our scalar field f, tells us that the square root of t star t is nice enough that there's an orthonormal basis of v consisting of eigenvectors of the square root of t star t. We really understand what that operator looks like. The first operator, s, is an isometry. All isometries are normal operators. If our scalar field is the set of complex numbers, then the complex spectral theorem also gives us a complete description of s. In particular, it tells us that v has an orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors of s. Thus, we have very nice descriptions of both s and the square root of t star t. Warning. In the complex case, we get an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors for s and an orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors of the square root of t star t. However, those two orthonormal bases might be different, and there might be no way to choose them to be the same. By the way, we'll see later a description of isometries on real inner product spaces. Now let's look at an outline of the proof of the polar decomposition. If v is a vector in our vector space, then the norm of t of v squared is equal to t of v inner product t of v. Flip the t in the second slot to the first slot where it becomes t star, as shown in the second equation here. Now, we have, the squ we have t star t, which is a positive operator, so it has a unique positive square root, so we can replace t star t with the square root of t star t squared, as shown in the third equation here. Now flip one of those square root of t star t's to the other side. It's already a self-adjoint operator, so no need to adjoin it. Now notice that we have a vector inner product with self, which gives us the norm squared of that vector. If we look at the first and last entries in this string of equations, both of which are now highlighted in red, 
and then take square roots of both sides, we can conclude that the norm of t of v is equal to the norm of the square root of t star t applied to v. Now define a linear map S1 from the range of the square root of t star t to the range of t by the equation shown here. There's actually a subtlety here. One needs to check that S1 is well defined. That actually follows from the equation still highlighted in red, the bottom of the left column. Please see the book for details. The equation at the bottom of the left column also shows that S1 is an isometry, meaning the norm of S1 of u is equal to the norm of u for all vectors u in the domain of S1. If the range of the square root of t star t is the whole vector space v, then we're done, because then we can let s equal s1. We have an isometry on v, and from the very way we've defined s1, now s, we see that t is equal to s times the square root of t star t. However, it's not always the case that the range of the square root of t star t is the whole vector space v. So here's what we do when that doesn't happen. We extend S1 to an isometry, uh, which will be called S, on all of V. We do this by noting that the range of the square root of t star t and the range of t have the same dimensions, thus their orthogonal complements have the same dimensions, and thus there's an isometry from the orthogonal complement of the range of the square root of t star t to the orthogonal complement of the range of t. And then we extend by linearity. This is way too vague, but a video is not the appropriate place to see all the details. The details are spelled out quite carefully in the book. Please be sure to read the entire proof in the book, because here we have only given an outline of the main ideas of the proof. This concludes part one of the video on polar decomposition and singular value decomposition. If you see a small picture of a slide in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the next video.